Hello, my name is Mashru Shahid Hussain, Professor of English, Jahangir University, Bangladesh, presently Fulbright Scholar in Residence at Indiana University, Northwest. Today, the title of my presentation is this, Apprehending the Last Taboo, Sexual Victimization of Men in Film and Literature. I assume that many of us are familiar with Oedipus, that fated Greek king who was destined to kill his father and marry his mother. We refer to Oedipus to underscore the fight between fate and free will. Freud used the story to develop his theory of Oedipus complex. What we, however, often tend to forget is to ask a common sense question. Why was Oedipus' family cursed? The family was cursed because Oedipus' father, Laius, once raped a young man, Prince Chrysippus, who later allegedly committed suicide. It brings to the fore two issues. First, sexual victimization of men happens. It's a reality. And second, in the academia, public spheres, and popular imagination, events of sexual victimization of men have been routinely repressed and systemically silenced. My research is an assault to that silence, that last taboo and Macmillan's births. In spite of substantial evidence of men's vulnerability to sexual violence, sexual victimization of men, or SVM, has remained overlooked, unacknowledged, even imperceptible. It is apropos of this scenario that my research offers a critical reading of the representation of SVM in films and literature. My talk will unfold in three phases. First, the problematics of SVM. I preferred sexual victimization to sexual violence in order to underscore the politics of victimhood. Sexual victimization of men is an exploitative process of subjecting an individual to non-consensual sexual encounter. With a view to asserting the perpetrator's control and domination of the body and the psyche of the victim. In today's talk, I will concentrate on sexual victimization of men by men. Let me locate three dynamics of SVM. First, it is imbricated upon power. It is a mechanism to wound the body and terrify the soul of the male victim, for example, male rape during war and ethnic conflict. Second, it is premised upon masculinities. Here is a contest between two or more men, and the victimized man, because of being vulnerable to forced penetration, can feel emasculated or feminized. Third, SVM involves the body. The perpetrator invades the victim's body, and this intimate invasion adds new meaning to the body. The assault damages the victim's body, and it is likely to confound bodily integrities from sexual orientation and gender role to manhood and self-autonomy, generating trauma and silence. These three dynamics may explain why SVM is rarely reported and represented. However, SVM is represented in films and literature. And this takes me to the second part of my talk, the politics of SVM. I will outline seven frames of representing SVM in film and literary texts worldwide. By framing, I mean the way a text frames, that is, constructs and circulates its subject. Now, the first major frame is foregrounding SBM. Claire Cohen observed how the history of sexually victimized men has been disavowed in favor of that pertaining to women. SBM, however, appears in several ancient and classical texts. For example, in the Egyptian myth of Seth and Horus. But apart from the Greek animate, they have not received proper attention. Modern literatures and the post-1970s films are relatively accommodative of SVM, yet scholarly investment is scanty. The second frame is desensitizing criminality. It happens when, for example, you make fun of male rape. Comedy can rob sexual abuse of its violent and abusive nature. For Edwards and Turchik, quote, to no other type of violent crime is as commonly depicted as humorous as male rape, unquote. The humorous depiction of SVM runs the risk of decriminalizing rape or depicting rape as deserved justice, as we find in the 1970 American film Where's Papa? The third frame is manipulating gendered silence. Since SVM is likely to generate compromised manhood and reduced masculinity, silence is often deemed the major coping mechanisms. Most texts that cover silence do not offer redeeming suggestions. However, there are some that expose the devastating consequences of such silence. For example, the 2010 Indian film, I Am. The fourth frame is broaching psychocorporeality. Sexual assault is a major force in the political cultural construction 
of class, colonialism, race, and ethnicity. For example, male rape in the war in Bosnia. While some texts conflation of sexual abuse and ethnicity is misleading, for example, the 2005 film Fierce People, there are texts that effectively broach the complex mix. For example, Afghan-American Khalid Husseini's novel The Kite Runner. The fifth frame is dealing with queerity. Sexual abuse has been feminized to such an extent that SBM is considered less as crime and more as buggery in Cohen's words. Thus, SBM is quickly confused with gay lust, but this is never a major case. For example, the abuse Zaminder in the 2012 Bangladeshi film Ghetu Putra Komola is a bisexual pederast. However, homosexuality too triggers sexual aggression. For example, the Portuguese film O Fantasma, released in 2000. The sixth frame is subverting the victim perpetrator schema. In response to McKinnon's victim feminism that views men as, as essentially offenders and women victims, Mardorosian called for a reconceptualization of victimization. SVM destabilizes the binary oppositions of woman, man, victim perpetrator, act, passive active schema. A good demonstration of such destabilization is English playwright Sarah Kane's play, Blasted. The seventh frame that I identified is problematizing the semiotics of violence. There are texts that contest and reconfigure the dominant frames of male victimhood and hierarchical masculinity. For example, the 1996 American film Slippers reconfigures the silence of poor abused men who speak without speakers and avenge sexual abuse. This takes me to the third and last part of my talk, the poetics of SVM. I contend to address SVM, a new framework is required, which shares with, but is different from, the framework through which sexual victimization of women is approached. I call it grammar of male victimization. It is a critical effective framework to assist efficient understanding, representation, and reading of SVM. Appropriating Joseph Spiegel's SAM model of dynamics and effects, I propose that the study and representation of SVM must involve its three phases, the pre-abuse, the during-abuse, and the post-abuse scenarios. And it must involve the biopsychosocial dynamics of those three phases. That is, it involves the biological nature of SVM, for example, gastronomical effects. It involves the psychological and neurological nature of SVM, from PTSD to amnesia, and it involves the social nature of SVM, from shame and stigma to disruption in career. I also call for the reframing of the existing heteropatriarchal narratives of SVM, which involves referencing the second part of my talk, the unsilencing, the sensitizing, the disempowering, the queering that is destabilizing the gendered binaries, and the deconstruing of SVM. This brings me to the end of my talk, I believe, that sensitizing people, spatially informing and sensitizing men of male vulnerability to sexual victimization is crucial to make the world more inclusive, more tolerant, more empathic, and more livable. Thank you.